Okay, um, today I'm going to talk about the thermal estimation. We know that in order to measure the CMB signal from a uh, four sky uh, microwave uh, detection, we have to remove the foreground first. So that means a reliable foreground estimation will be the precondition to get a reliable CMB estimation. Today I'm going to talk mainly about the thermal dust emission. And regarding the thermal dust emission, we have already some uh, very good estimations, like the ones given by Plant in 2013, 2015, and the GNLRC estimation. The common point of these three different estimations is that they all assume a single component thermal dust emission. But we also have some other works that are shown uh, multiple, uh, yeah, multiple thermal dust com uh, components, like the work by Koka and Fixer. So they are all very nice works, but the existence of them already tell us that we are still shooting abroad. We don't have a very clear answer on whether the thermal dust emission should be treated by single component or multi-component. So maybe we are saying single component is very nice, but multi-component might also be not bad. And which is the uh, real case, who knows. But eventually, we have to give a clear answer to whether the thermal dust should be treated as a single component or multi-component. Strictly speaking, if we only want an answer like yes or no, then we already have it. Because we are looking deeply into the space, we have the integration along the line of sight, so there's no reason to say that the thermal dust coming from 1 kiloparsec is the same to the thermal dust coming from 10 kiloparsec. So, we know that the thermal dust uh, must be a not single component, but this kind of statement is, this is correct, but this is not very meaningful, because we don't require the thermal dust emission to be exactly single component. We only require it to be approximately single component. So, a meaningful discussion will be whether the single component is good enough as an approximation. And this is especially important for extrapolation down to 100 gigahertz, or the frequencies around around that, because this is the most important frequency band for detection of the primordial gravitational wave. A standard uh, procedure is that we are going to measure the thermal dust emission from a high frequency band, because that high frequency band has much higher amplitude, and it's easy to get an uh, excellent signal to noise ratio. And by extrapolation down to the middle frequency, we can inherit the excellent signal to noise ratio. But this kind of inheritation is not for free. We have to pay for it. And the price is the reliability of the thermal dust motor. Of course, we have a lot of uh, forward uh, estimation methods. Some of them use extrapolation, some of them don't. But in any case, the high frequency will always be the most important contributor to the thermal dust emission. That means we can pay the price in different means, either by cash or by credit card, but we cannot choose no pay. So our work here is to try to evaluate how big is the price, just to help us avoid bankruptcy. So uh, we also noticed that here we're dealing with a simplified situation, because we only care about whether the thermal dust is single component or not. If it's not single component, then we are going to have a lot of other possibilities. They are all open for discussion, but we're not going that far. So if the real case is uh, for thermal dust is multi-component and we treat it as single component, then uh, if we're working only with a few high frequency, this might also be uh, this might still be okay. But when we uh, uh, go to the extrapolation down to middle frequency, this is not going to be reliable. On the contrary, if the real case is single component, but we assume a multi-component estimation, then we are going to have overfitting. We can even fit the noise, systematics, and take them uh, as the thermal dust emission. So both cases are not uh, satisfactory. So we have a, should have a clear answer to why the single component is good enough. We should choose only one assumption. The idea to, to do that is like this. First of all, let's have a look at the, these two maps. They are a sample of the sky coming from the plant, uh, 545 kilohertz and 857 kilohertz. We can see that they, are very, uh, they look very similar to each other. If we don't look at the title, we don't look at the amplitude, then we can hardly tell which is which. So in this case, if they are very similar to each other, it's not a difficult to get the relative amplitude of the dust emission from these two patches by linear regression. So the case is, 
uh, we, if we get the linear, the user linear regression to get the dust amplitude, the ratio of the dust amplitude, we call it uh, from the date, we call it R, and from the existence dust estimation like 2013, 2015, we call it R0, R0, there's going to be an error between them, which is R minus R0. And if the two patches are uh, highly correlated with, with each other, this will cast a very strong limit on the, the error R minus R0. And this is the criteria that we need for this combination. If the error is within the allowed range, then we say that the single component assumption is good enough. But if the error is far beyond this range, then we say that this is not good enough. Now, here we come to some equations. We are shown that the date x prime, y prime are consistent of the, uh, are consistent of the thermal dust component and the lock dust component. So here the lock dust component contains everything, including noise, systematics, residual CMB, other components, everything. So we are shown that uh, for the thermal dust component, x and y, uh, from two uh, different frequency bands, they are highly correlated. And the date, they are also highly correlated because we have a, a selection effect. We choose only the patches that are highly correlated. And we are shown that the thermal dust component and the lump dust component, they are not strongly correlated. So by the definition of the covariance, we can get the value of the uh, ratio given by linear regression. And with some uh, uh, further calculation, which is a little bit complicated and not difficult. We can get the connection between the R0, which is given by the dust motor, and R, which is given by the date. And by Taylor expansion of this equation, we can see that the value of 1 minus R divided by R0, this is at the same level, small number, to 1 minus the cross correlation between the date in these two patches. So they are the same level, small numbers. And this is the criteria that we need. And this is also consistent to our direct interaction because the two patches they are very highly correlated, then the uh, ratio given by linear regression cannot go wildly. Also, this is consistent to our impression, and before we go to the real date, we would like to run a simulation to see if everything is uh, within our expectation. So this is a simulation result. Uh, we have the date, we have the dust motor, and we have the long dust component. And in the simulation, we allow up to 30% chance correlation between the dust and lump dust components. In the horizontal axis, this is the cross correlation between the two patches. The vertical axis is R divided by R0. So we can see that if we choose a cross correlation to be higher than 95%, then the deviation, relative uh, deviation between R and R0 will also be limited roughly around plus minus 5%. So this is quite very consistent to our expectation. And this is the criteria that we need. If the, the error we get from the real date is we see this kind of a limitation, then we see that the single component assumption is good enough. But if it's far beyond this range, then we see that it's not good enough. Now we come to the real date. Uh, uh, in calculation, we use 10 degree radius patches uh, on the sky, centers on each sky pixel. So if the cross correlation between two bands is higher than 95%, then we use it. That is the right part, and if the cross correlation is less than 95%, then we don't use it. Um, here, the horizontal axis is the R0, which is the ratio given by the motor. Vertical axis is the R1, which is given by the date. The right line is nothing but the trace on which R0 equal to R. So if the single component as a, uh, assumption is good enough, then we expect that the black door should be clustered around the red line. But if it's not good enough, then we are going to have a strong dispersion. So first, look at this panel. This is the result from 857 at 545 gigahertz. So we know that these two frequency bands are dominated by the thermal dust emission, and we can see that, yes, the black doors looks to be clustered around the red line, although we can see some deviation, but this is not very significant. But when we go to the next frequency bands, which is 353 and 217 gigahertz, we can see a strong dispersion. Note that the, the average cross correlation between the two patches for this uh, uh, 270 and 350 uh, 3 gigahertz, this is 0 0.996. 
That means we allow something like a one or two percent deviation between R and R R zero. But we can see here this is apparently higher than this range than this allowed range. The most uh, significant deviation coming from the middle frequency, which is 143 and 100Hz. In this case, we can see that black doors are completely deviated from the red line. Uh, especially, uh, uh, at least we expect that when R0, which is the ratio coming from the motor, increases, we expect the R, which is given by date, will also be increasing. But in reality, we see the reverse tendency. They are anti-correlated. This is not expected at all. So in this case, we believe that that means the single component assumption is not good enough. So here, uh, this is very similar to the previous analysis. The only difference is that we remove the galactic plane completely, plus minus 30 degree. The reason is that we know the emission coming from the galactic plane is much more complicated, because we our line of sight could go across the galactic plane we have a lot of uh, much more objects along the line of sight. So if we remove all, all, everything from the galactic plane and we see the same differences, and we see that although there are some changes, but um, um, the change is not big, we still have nearly the same conclusion that for the middle frequency, well, I get 43 gigahertz, we have very strong deviation. We also try to smooth the date by five degrees this is to surprise the noise. However, as we can see from our uh, calculation, uh, the contribution of, of the noise is already uh, strongly constrained by selecting only the highly correlated patches. So we expect that this kind of smoothing will not give you uh, will not give much differences. And this is also the result. By smoothing, we don't see much differences. We still have a strong division here. And we even try to use the polarization date. This is the polarization date uh, uh, given by uh, 353 gigahertz and 270 gigahertz. So in this case, sorry, yeah, here. So uh, we can see from the polarization date, we still get the strong dispersion, and especially for the uh, polarization date uh, from 143 and 100 gigahertz. We can see that the red line here is almost invisible, meaning a very strong deviation. And because we uh, have a very strong constraint by the cross correlation, if we have a very strong cross correlation, then um, the contribution from the long small dust component will not be significant. By this way, we can easily exclude most of the uh, possible uh, reasons of uh, contamination like the CIB, brief emission, so they light systematic and the to CIB. And because we have also tried to use the polarization date, so we can further exclude the contribution from the brief emission because it's almost invisible for, for the polarization. So a current conclusion is that the single component looks like not a good assumption for the thermal transformation especially for the middle frequency, namely uh, around 100 gigahertz. And uh, if this is really the case, if we finally confirm this result after more uh, cross checks, then the measurement of more frequency bands at high, uh, at, at high frequency will be greatly preferred because that will provide, because a solution for multi-frequency will require much more frequency bands. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs>